Everyone loves to trade in Dynasty. All right? It's one of the big reasons why Dynasty Leagues are so fun. Being too active in trades is one of the big reasons why you probably are not good at Dynasty. I've said this many times. It's a lesson that you need to learn in redraft over and over and over again, right? When you're drafting for your season-long league. Value does not win you championships. Good players that score a lot of fantasy points win you championships. And I get it. It's addicting. It's like playing slots. You're getting offers. You're looking at the the what-if factors, the upside. Fantasy players inherently look at upside. When you think of it's it's why everyone bets the overs on every season-long prop. It's why Vegas always wins. The most profitable bets in the world are, if you want to be a profitable better, take the under on everything. I didn't say you're going to have the most fun betting, but if you want to be the most, the person who takes more unders than overs will always be the more profitable better. We are just wired to want things to happen, to want the overs to happen. We think a guy is good, therefore it's going to equate to a bajillion fucking fantasy points. Very rarely does it happen. I challenge you to play smarter going forward. That's what today's video is all about. It's about players on your dynasty team that I would consider must keeps. All right. You're not fielding offers for them. You're not actively looking for offers for them. And I tweeted this out and it made me so happy to have so many corny ass people in the replies of this tweet. <laughs> Fucking I said, are there any players on your dynasty team that you would consider to be untradeable? Guys that you want, no matter what happens, on September 7th, when Thursday Night Football kicks off, they're on your team right now, they will be on your starting roster come September 7th. And 99% of the replies, well, you know, some people had some players, but they were the same top players over and over again. 95% of the replies were, every player has a price. You never play without fucking looking at train fucking... Shut your mouth and know your role. That's what I'll say. I'll tell you what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. You know your damn role and shut your damn mouth. If you want to keep a fucking player, keep them. There are guys that you should keep on your roster, regardless of all. Yeah, if someone offers me six firsts, I'm going to shut the fuck up. No one's offering you six firsts for Devonta Smith. When I say untradeable, you're just not trading them in any sort of relative trade. Of course, if someone offers you six firsts for anyone, you still fucking turn it down if you have Jonathan Taylor and Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow. Okay? Value doesn't win you championships. Good players that score wholesome-ass fantasy points in your lineup win you championships. So we're going to go down five players today that I would consider to be must-keep on dynasty rosters, at least in my opinion. And I'll give you breakdowns as to why I feel this way. We're going to do a part two of this video as well, because I knew the intro to this was going to be long. So I didn't want to do a list of 10 players because you know, I start rambling on and it's not good for anybody's mental health. So what we're going to do is we're going to tuck our shirts in. We're going to stop yelling. Let's take a breath. And we shall eat. What's cracking? Big dogs. Welcome. Bike to the channel. Welcome. Bike. To the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat. And uh, you already know the gist of today's video. We did the intro after the outro that intro the intro. All right. And this ain't the intro. This is the this entree. No intro, so here's the, entree. the key takeaway from everything I've said up to this point is you don't have to trade in Dynasty. You don't have to trade just because there's a trade available. You don't always have to be actively looking for trades. You're going to put yourself in a ditch doing that eventually all right like it's okay to say this guy's really good 
I would like to have him on my fantasy team for the next few years and have him score fantasy points for me. It's like, it's okay to say, I know I need to be, I feel like we're in a 12 step dynasty program where I need to be the person who tells you it's okay. You're not alone. You're allowed to like fucking players and keep them on your team. A lot of the time, the way I operate my dynasty teams is I will have a core of three to four players that I basically enact a no trade clause for them. Okay where I want the core of my team to be built around them. Sometimes it's three running backs. Sometimes it's a quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end. I say, you know what? I want to build around these guys for the next few years and have all the other pieces fall in line, not having a moving carousel all the time of like, okay, I have these three awesome players. Actually, let me move one of them for a couple picks and hope that I hit on one of those picks later on and then rebuild a team. Two years. It's just you don't need to do it all the time, all right? For instance, I uh, we're going to do an example because I'm, I'm going to put together a string of videos that I think will be very useful for you guys. I did a startup draft last year, this last previous year, right before the 2021 season kicked off, where I decided basically directly to go into a productive struggle where I drafted a ton of young players and I traded for future picks and I knew that I wasn't competing in year one. And this is the squad. You'll see that I have a lot of this it's super flex league. Uh, start two running backs, three wide receivers, tight end, two flexes, and the super flex. Half PPR running back, full PPR wide receiver, 1.5 PPR tight end. All right? Again, a lot of young talent. The white stars I would consider like promising dudes that I'm that are, you know, that I know are valuable, that I'm okay trading right now. It's Justin Fields, Saquon Barkley, Rashad Bateman, Debo Samuel, Damian Harris, Albert O, uh, Eno, Chase Edmonds, Khalil Herbert. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson, Irv Smith. I probably could put Jameis Winston on there because it is super flex. Curtis Samuel too, whatever. You will see a, a few gold stars. You'll see it next to Travis Etienne's name. You will see it next to Kadarius Tony's name. You will see it next to Kyle Pitts's name. Those are the guys, again, that when September 7th rolls around, they will be on my roster. They will be on this team. I want the full 2022 experience of those three guys for better or for worse. Because I believe if those guys hit their upside, we have a core, a league winning core to build around them. And we have other great players on the team. Like I said, Justin Fields, Saquon Barkley, Debo Samuel. Like we have other players that are going to help me elevate my team. And there's a commonality amongst those three star players. All right. ETN, Tony Pitts. ETN and Tony both just turned 23 years old. Kyle, uh, Kyle Pitts is still like barely 21 years old. Uh, and, and of course, you you want to mix and match the players that you would consider your gold star players, right? Like I could, inc I could include Justin Fields there. Uh, but to be honest, and this is a very subjective take for me, I have my concerns when it comes to Justin Fields right now. Maybe you want him to be a gold star player for you, and I have no, I have no argument uh, against that, right? It, I would personally be fine moving Justin Fields for a lower-ranked quarterback, uh, plus like a first round pick or something like that. Like I have no, no qualms with that whatsoever. And you could say like, why aren't Saquon and Debo in there, right? They probably have the most upside of any of these players. They're 25, 26 years old. They're just like in a little bit of a different age tier from the other ones. Uh, and I'm not, listen, like I'm by no means actively selling those guys. I'm not hitting the trademark and being like, who wants Saquon? Who wants Debo Samuel? I'm just saying if a trade is presented to me that's in fair value, I would consider it. The other guys, I would need something that's, outrageously in my favor, which isn't going to come my way. And you could ask about Rashad Bateman, uh, but again, I don't think he fits the mold of those other three gold star players in terms of like the upside, right? Like the gold star players, I think have upside again to be top five at their position if they're healthy the entirety of the year. Uh, maybe not in this upcoming exact year, but in the near, near, near future. So I'm looking at Rashad Bateman. I'm like, yes, he's a young, exciting player that I loved as a prospect, but does he have the upside looking at the Ravens, who are about to extend Lamar Jackson, will continue to be one of the most run-heavy offenses in the league. He's competing with Hollywood and Mark Andrews. Like, it's still something that I'm not comfortable saying he has the upside that fits him into that tier of the old uh, the Gold Star players. And trust me, I know half you guys probably dipped out already, and you're like, "Fuck this Gold Star! Everybody has a price, bro. It's a fucking market. Fuck you. This is how I play, and it has worked tremendously for me. I like to build around a core. Now, along with this talent." 
I also have in this upcoming rookie draft, because I went productive struggle off the rip and I traded some of my startup picks or moved back in the draft, whatever. I also have the 103, the 104, the 112, the 204, the 303, and the, and the 304. So this team will be absolutely loaded with young talent come the end of that rookie draft. My next video, which will be an awesome play on to this, which is going to come out Friday. So I believe this one's dropping Tuesday. I'm going to do a full rookie mock draft with the actual picks I have in this league. So if you're playing on Sleeper, and your league is already set up for 2022, it will have all the picks that you have for the rookie draft, and you could literally mock draft based on those picks. So we're going to take this exact roster I have, this team that I have, based on the deficiencies and the young players, whatever, and take the picks I have, the 103, 4, 12, 204, 303, and do a rookie mock draft, a full one, that will be probably one of the most contextual mock drafts you could find on the interwebs right now, on YouTube, because I'm literally going to be looking at the players I have right now, the direction of my team, what my team needs are, and what I would do in those spots based on the team that I have, okay? So it should be a fun video. If you're not subscribed to the channel already, make sure you do so so you catch that on Friday. Tomorrow, Noah will be ripping more running back stuff. Thursday, we have our office vlog as always. So again, make sure that you are subscribed. Again, I knew this would be a long-ass way to intro the video because I was I, I wouldn't even say I was excited. I was angry. And when I'm angry, I'm excited because I get to fucking yell at you guys for a while. But it's a long winded way of saying that it is OK to keep players on your team in Dynasty. So let's talk about some of the guys I am not moving off of at any cost right now. And you shouldn't either. When I asked the question, you know, do you have any players in your Dynasty teams that you consider untradeable? I got a lot of Jamar Chase, Kyle Pitts, Jonathan Taylor's, some Justin Jefferson's. Um, and some of the other guys are like obvious, like Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. Like I'm not moving him for anything. You can move him for all these first round picks that you want, but he already showed his RB one overall upside. And those are literal league winning type players that I don't want seven dark shots. League winning type players come around once every three to four years. Jonathan Taylor is that next Christian McCaffrey is that next Todd Gurley is that next Le'Veon Bell from yesteryear. Okay. You're going to throw three darts, hoping that you hit the middle bullseye that's probably even smaller than a normal bullseye on a dartboard because of value. No, just no. You already hit the fucking middle of the bullseye with Jonathan Taylor. He is a guy that single-handedly gets you to the playoffs and probably a championship over the next three years. You don't disperse that for value on the chance of getting a fucking Jonathan Taylor. It just, you got people are so stupid sometimes. Okay. I'm going to start off with one that might be a little bit of a surprise, okay? Before we do the obvious ones, and that is Michael Pittman, wide receiver of the Indianapolis Colts. I just traded for him in my most prestigious dynasty league, the Go Fade Me Dynasty League. Shout out to everybody in that league. I love you so very, very much. Psych. Fucking hate y'all. Michael Pittman I just got for the 203 and the 211. I got Michael Pittman and the 302. So I moved back three spots and basically swapped the 203 for Michael Pittman. I legitimately think Michael Pittman has, you know, fantasy wide receiver one, like alpha upside. I think he was a wide receiver 17 last year, and he had one of the worst circumstances to be in among like upside wide receivers. He had 130 targets, 88 catches over a thousand years, uh, over a thousand yards last year with Carson fucking Wentz. All right. When you look at his numbers on player profiler and you look at the advanced numbers, Michael Pittman's target accuracy and target quality rating were both outside of the top 60 wide receivers last year. So on average, there was two wide receivers basically from every team that got more accurate targets than Michael Pittman. When you look at the quarterbacks, Matt Ryan last year, eighth in accuracy rating, fourth in pressure completion rate, third in deep ball completion percentage. When you look at Carson Wentz, 31st in accuracy rating, 28th in pressure completion rate, 32nd in catchable pass rate overall. Like, this dude was genuinely horrible. And I don't think Matt Ryan's anything special. He's got a fucking piece of spaghetti for a right arm at this point. But he's more accurate. He's more poised. He's much better suited to lead an offense. I think there's a chance that Michael Pittman goes into this year and the next three years with 160 to 170 targets per year. And I want that in my wide receiver, too flex spot on my dynasty team and i'm not giving it up for anything short of fucking 22 mcribs horrible example because mcribs are disgusting and that's like 20 fucking four dollars but y'all get the point when we look at matt ryan and we look at the way he has dispersed his targets in his career came onto the falcons in 2008 roddy white those first five years 
149 targets, 165, 179, 179, 143. Like, there's a big chart. Y'all can read it if you're on YouTube. If you're listening via podcast, uh, I would suggest go checking out on YouTube, but I would first suggest leaving us a rating and review. That would be very much appreciated. As you could tell, I do a lot of prep and research for all of these individual videos, so the effort would be nicely rewarded from a five-star rating review, and I would love you forever for it. Basically, the chart just shows whoever Matt Ryan's number one target was got a fuckload of targets, and this will be... Michael Pittman's role. He will be the wide receiver one in a Matt Ryan offense. I know it's going to be much more run heavy than the Falcons have been, but I don't care. Now, I was listening to a podcast between uh, Josh Larkey and Cody Carp over at Player Profile, their the Road to Underworld podcast. They released a podcast last week that you guys can go check out. I will link it in the show notes called Michael Pittman Route Tactician. And I think it's around like the 39 minute mark when they start talking about some of these numbers. They were exposing a few numbers that they're working on behind the scenes. And they're specific to wide receivers, like success versus man coverage, success versus zone coverage, like overall win rate for wide receivers. And they're going to be eventually quantifying it for like the quality of the cornerback that they're going against as well. Because like if someone, if if two wide receivers both have a 65% win rate against man coverage, Devontae Adams is going to be more impressive because he goes against the top cornerback on every other defense. Whereas like the wide receiver three, if like, you know, Christian Kirk or Rondell Moore or something has a really high man uh, win rate, they're not getting the guy that DeAndre Hopkins is getting. So they're going to be able to quantify for that as well, which a lot of really cool numbers coming on. But in basically every single category, Michael Pittman rocked these fucking numbers. Number two overall in terms of highest win rate for wide receivers against defensive backs. Win rate versus man coverage, which is the big one for me. That overall win rate versus uh, cornerbacks is can be a little bit skewed because some like slot wide receivers, some zone wide receivers that are really good at zone will skew their numbers because it takes into account both zone and man together. Win rate versus man coverage. This is probably an indicator of how good you actually are as a wide receiver. Michael Pittman, number five overall amongst all wide receivers. And he's always going against a cornerback one. Against zone, number three. This dude won at every level of the field against every type of coverage. I am so excited for Michael Pittman this year. I think he's going to take a massive third-year leap. Don't trade him now. If you're going to trade him, wait till next offseason when he's when he's a second-round pick in, in redraft leagues, okay? Michael Pittman, number one on this list. Number two is Christian McCaffrey, but I want to talk about the Christian McCaffrey of products, and that would be the Felix Gray glasses that are on my face right now. Felix Gray develop these glasses that are blue light blocking glasses but you know by this point in life in 2022 i'm sure you've heard that it's a it's a very buzzy word right now where people getting more into tech and worrying about products that are health conscious and these very much are y'all know i've been rocking these for years far prior to when i was working with felix gray felix gray has these blue light blocking glasses that are like a luxury pair of them that look fucking phenomenal on your face they make you look semi-smart right there's only so far that you could take my fucking face but felix gray takes me to the ceiling, right? And uh, they are blue light blocking glasses, basically for those of y'all that don't understand the tech behind them. We have a lot of light coming out of, we have a lot of uh, blue light coming out of the screens that we're looking at on the daily, right? Monitors, laptops, phones, whatever. That blue light tells your body not to produce melatonin. When that's coming in, it's saying, okay, you're awake. We want you awake. Do not produce melatonin. So these things are perfect to wear at night. If you're someone that scrolls in your bed all the time, you're sitting on TikTok, you're watching our IG reels, at BDGE, double underscore, on all platforms. Your body's going to be staying awake after that. Your eyes are going to start straining at night, and you're not going to get a good night's sleep, okay? You put these on for an hour before you go to bed, two hours before you go to bed, and it blocks the light coming off of those screens. Your body starts producing melatonin. Thus, you will fall asleep cleanly and soundly when you're trying to fall asleep, all right? Blue light blocking glasses are one of the best purchases I've ever made, specifically from Felix Gray. The link to purchase them will be right down below. If you go through that link, you will be supporting our brand, obviously. And uh, that means the world to us. But I couldn't back these products any humanly more. All right. I did want to say I was wearing these for the plug. Um, it is morning right now. So there's no reason for me to try to produce melatonin. Hence the coffee that I'm drinking right now. Um, yeah. So go check out Felix Gray again. First link in the description. Let's move to. The Felix Gray of fantasy players. Christian McCaffrey. A lot of people want to move off of C-Mac, and I get it. But this is like the purest form of value versus production argument that you can find. There are like six to eight players in fantasy football that are truly league winners. And C-Mac is like three of them. 
One of the principles in investing, right? Making plus EV moves. And a lot of those, like you, you listen to any investor and a lot of them will, any good investor, and a lot of them will tell you like they make moves sometimes knowing that it's likely not going to work out. Like they'll invest in something knowing that there is a 65 to 70% chance that it doesn't work out, that it that the investment fails. However, when you weigh the likelihood of it hitting or not hitting with the upside of if it does hit, it takes care of everything else pretty much, okay? And that's the way you should be operating when you're looking at a guy like Christian McCaffrey. His upside, his pure fantasy upside, which we've already seen in action, and again, he's like barely 26 years old, still in his prime, the upside of if he hits, while it might be lower than it has been in previous years, right? You might not trust his injury history anymore. It, say his upside is only a 25 to 30% chance of hitting. If it does fucking hit, you borderline win your fantasy league, okay? That's a guy that I want on my team. I don't care about value. I don't care about what you think you're turning these picks into, okay? So Christian McCaffrey is a guy that wipes out fucking L's, all right? No matter how many L's you take, if he hits his upside, it wipes it out. So C-Mac is a guy that if I own, if I've dealt with the trials and tribulations of Christian McCaffrey for the last two years, I'm holding on to him because the upside of him hitting is so fucking high, as is with these other two guys, all right? Before we get into them, make sure you hit the thumbs up on the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're doing videos like this fucking literally six days, seven days a week. It's a beautiful thing. So is the Cincinnati Bengals offense. Now, the stack of Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. And I realize not everybody's going to have this stack. Some might just have Burrow. Some might just have Chase. I'm playing in a lot of leagues where the stack is there, where the player who owns Joe Burrow also owns Jamar Chase. This is literally like owning Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill in 2018. I have no idea why the fuck you would ever give that up. We already know about the correlation in stacking players, right? And the success rate when it comes to best ball and redraft. And it actually gives you a plus EV in terms of like overall wins that you're going to have for the season and your likelihood of winning a championship when you are stacking good players. And for all intents and purposes, Dynasty is just a redraft league year over year over year over year. So those numbers hold steady with the Dynasty leagues, obviously. Like the number of times this stack in itself is going to purely win you leagues by itself over the next five years is is just going to be unheard of, right? Last year, Burrow started slow because of the ACL tear. It was literally Jamar Chase's rookie season. Now they have a massively great upgraded offensive line. Second year, I guess third, fourth year of chemistry between the two of them. I wouldn't be surprised if over the next five years, we had a Joe Burrow quarterback one overall in fantasy and Jamar Chase wide receiver one overall in fantasy combination, fantasy season one combination, probably more than once, all right? What they did last year was really impressive, but only the beginning. So if you have that, if you have that stack, I literally would not move them for anything. There is no number of picks or players that I would move either of these guys for. And it probably holds true for either of them individually. I can't imagine giving up Jamar Chase uh, at the ripe age of fucking 21, barely 22, maybe. And you have him for the next 10 years. Same thing with Joe Burrow. Like, I'm not moving either of these guys individually. If you have the stack, it's only exponentiated. All right. Move on to the last and final player. I want to know in the comment section, though, who is someone on your team that is untradeable to you, that you would not move under any circum under any fucking reasonable circumstances. If you come at me with every fucking player, you're getting, you're getting, I'm calling the police, I'm calling the police. You're getting blocked from everything BDG has ever been involved in. You have no chance of ever engaging or participating with anything that we do. If you fucking say that every player has a fucking price. Last up on this list, Cortland Sutton, wide receiver, Denver Broncos. Simply put, if I have him on my team, I need to see what he does with Russell Wilson. I need to see it. Sutton was so awesome two years ago with shitty quarterback play. Now he's two years removed from his ACL tear, right? I think that's kind of been going underplayed about him coming back from his ACL tear last year. Could have been a very big factor into why he didn't produce well. And now he is one of the most accurate deep ball throwers in the history of the NFL. Like this is one where I am extremely fine being wrong, right? If, if, if Russ is there, we go through the season the next two years and Sutton never goes over like the wide receiver 17 or 18 finish in fantasy, I can live with that. What I can't live with is moving him and then him being the next DK Metcalf with Russell Wilson and him shooting up to wide receiver one overall status in fantasy with Russell Wilson. If I own him in fantasy, I am going to be the one that finds out 
for better or worse, what he is with Russell Wilson there. Cortland Sutton, to me, is an untradeable player in fantasy, dynasty, life, anything. Okay? That's it. Those are my five must-keep players on dynasty teams right now. We will be doing a part two probably next week after we do the mock draft. So again, I have that that team I drafted last year in a startup draft. I will be doing a rookie mock draft based on that team, the picks I have on Friday. So make sure you're subscribed. And then probably Tuesday or, yeah, probably Tuesday of next week and the week after, I'll do another list of five must-keep players on your dynasty team because I already have those fucking written out. But let me know. Guys, that you will be keeping under any circumstances, don't piss me off in the comments. Today is not the day to piss me the fuck off. And make sure you go f- check out Felix Gray. They're beautiful. Link in the description. I love you. I'm out.